What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Brandon Metcalf. And Brandon, before I formally introduce you, and he runs three companies, actually, Assemble, Place Technology, and Blueprint Advisory. Um, before I introduce you formally, I want to mention other podcast episodes people should check out. And Brandon has a podcast, which we'll talk about, and he'll talk about some of his favorites, and maybe we'll talk about it right now. But um, since... Place Technology is SaaS company. I was thinking, what other cool SaaS companies have we've had on? And um, I did an episode with Sujan Patel, um, founder of Mailshake, among other SaaS companies uh, that he runs. And a big thank you, actually, for introducing today's guest, Brandon. Um, and Eugene Levin of SCM Rush uh, talked about their product and the millions of users they have um, and how they grew. Uh, the founder of uh, Zapier and Pipedrive and Aweber. Those are all good episodes, too. And Brandon, what are some of your favorites from Cash and Burn podcast? Oh, man. I mean, Cash and Burn's probably, you mentioned a lot of my madness that I have going on with all these different companies and <laughs> things, but Cash and Burn is truly probably my my favorite thing I get to do. Um, you know, we talk about, I talk to other software leaders and we're starting to expand it probably a little bit out of software, but about the big, the biggest challenges they face with building their businesses and how they overcome them. So it's really cathartic for me because I get to hear everyone else talk about the same pain that I live. But, you know, some of the cool guests are like, you know, we had Henry Shuck, the founder and CEO of Zoom Info. Um, so multi-billion dollar company. And um, uh, he told the story of how he grew that business and uh, how he used to sell and under, he sold under an alias when he was selling. Um, so he's he's a great episode. Uh Niji Sabaral from Agent Sync. Um, they're on fire with growth. And, you know, he talked about controlling the things you can and don't focus on the things you can't because um, he got sued a few different times. And how do you manage manage through that? Um, I had both of the founders from Kimball, um, which is now Katana. Um, and they talk about how they built businesses and how to think about recession and all that. Um, one of my best episodes was with... Um, uh, Sam Jacobs, uh, he's the CEO and founder of Pavilion, um, and he talks about how he got fired several times as as the CRO and what that's like and what you learn. So, just really good people with amazing stories. But you know, the goal of of my show is like hear what other people go through and how they survived it to hopefully give you some inspiration and and uh, help you get through the hurdles you're going through. Love it. Yeah. The, those are all really interesting stories. So check that out on, uh, you know, you can go to placetechnology.com and their podcast is on there too. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do uh, strategy, accountability, and full execution of that podcast. And as Brandon said, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way to do that than the profile of people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. Uh, I've been doing it for over a decade now. And like Brandon said, it's one of the most rewarding and best things I can do on a daily basis. So, and I'll I'll tell you, I'll just give you some some kudos for what you're doing there with that because uh, Carter, my VP of marketing at Place, he said I want you to do a podcast. I'm like, I don't want to do a podcast. What? No one wants to hear me do a podcast. Why in the world would I want to do a podcast? He's like, you're doing a podcast. I'm like, if it brings us revenue, I'll do a podcast. <laughs> um, so we started out doing it and, you know, it, it actually just kind of organically, like he wanted to do an episode a month. I'm like, well, it's kind of like me, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do an episode a week um, so that it's meaningful. Um, but it is a great lead generation tool for us at Place because we're speaking to our audience. Um, so it's a great way to gain attention. So for anyone who doesn't want to do it, but your marketing team is saying, do it, do it. Yeah, and it's so many functions, Brandon. We won't get down that rabbit hole, but it's part, great partnerships, 
you do um it's good for lead generation it's good for content like you said it's good for professional development it's good for therapy you know when you're talking to other um you know founders who are going through what you're going through for all those reasons like i always tell people i do it if no one listen just from the professional development like before i talk to you i do research on you your companies and i learn so much just going into the interview before we even do the interview right so it's it's pretty amazing Totally agree. Um, so without further ado, Brandon, let me formally introduce you. Brandon Metcalf is an entrepreneur, Harvard Business School graduate with a very deep expertise in the software industry, particularly in the Salesforce ecosystem. And we mentioned he hosts the Cash and Burn podcast. He also oversees three companies, which we'll get into how does he actually do that, Place Technology, Assemble, and Blueprint Advisory. And previously, Brandon founded Talent Rover, which is a Salesforce-based global staffing and recruitment software company that it grew to become the ninth fastest growing software company in the U.S. in 2017, which was acquired in 2018. And right now, I think, Brandon, you're also, you're not busy enough. You are on the EO board of Austin, too. I love the EO. That's how I met Solution. Solution's a, a good friend and uh, um, yeah, the board's a lot of fun. It's, this is my second year on the board. I'm about to take a break next year, um, but then I'll probably be back on the board again the year after that. So, you know, we mentioned, you know, Sujin is very deep into the SaaS space. What's something that you learned from the conversations with Sujin? Oh, wow. I mean, Sujin was a guest on the podcast as well. So um, he he tells a really incredible story about figuring out um, who your ICP is and product market fit and, and all of that. Um, he, he's a very clever entrepreneur with what he does and what, how he thinks, um, and he's just dynamic. So I've got a lot of respect for him. He also buys and invests in a lot of uh, SaaS companies as well. So we want to talk about someone who has a finger on their pulse as to what's really going on at SaaS. It's a, he's a, he's a dynamic guy. So Brian, taking us a little bit to today, um, talent rover. Yeah. How did you get into that space? Tell people a little bit about that and how'd you get into that space? My God, if you if you would have told me in my early 20s I'd be doing what I'm doing today, I would have laughed at you hysterically. What did you uh, think you'd be doing in your early like in your early 20s? What did you think you were gonna Well, do? I knew I wanted to be an exec. I knew I wanted to be a CEO, but I didn't know what that meant. So like when I was in my early 20s, when I was still in school, I started working at um what was then Barnett Bank, which is now Bank of America. Um, and you know, I started off as a teller and there was an executive vice president who really liked me. And one day I just asked her, I'm like, how do I get your job in a nice way? Right. And she's like, you want to excel? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what do I need to do? And she's like, okay, let's create a plan for you. Um, and I remember one of the first things she's like, you need to win our annual incentive trip. I'm like, great. Tell me what I need to do. And she's like, well, as a teller, you need to get all these referrals for the personal bankers so they can sell stuff. I'm like, what do I need to sell? And she's like, well, the biggest thing is credit card apps. I'm like, great. So I, I asked her, I'm like, can I go stand in the drive through and talk to people as they're pulling in, like physically in the car? And I did that. And I started handing them credit card apps. And I crushed my credit card app goal. And I won the trip and, and all that. So then it was like, well, how do I become a bank manager? Well, she's like, you need to be a personal banker first. Great. Put me there. And it was the same thing. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I need to sell to go sell to be the top banker so I can get promoted to a branch manager. And she did. And I did. And then they gave me my first bank when I was 21 years old to manage. Um, and they sent me to Chicago, wow. to open banks in Chicago and all of that stuff. And I got bored with that. Um, I also didn't want to stay in retail banking. I wanted to experience something else. So I stumbled into staffing and recruiting. and. Um, started working for Kelly Services, did really, really well with Kelly, like was the sales manager for the state of Colorado. Then they sent me to Sacramento to turn that region around. And then they sent me to Northern California to run run the Kelly Financial there. Um, so shortly thereafter, I get recruited to a headhunting firm called CV Partners. And long story short, at CV Partners, I was doing Headhunting for like CFOs, VPs, finance, stuff like that. And then I got a random call to go interview at Google. Um, and when Google calls you, you go see what Google wants to talk to you about. Um, so I went through, it had to, I forget the exact count. It was more than 20 interviews. Um, wow. And got offered a great job offer. 
but wasn't super excited about the opportunity, but it was very flattering. Um, so I talked to the CEO of CV Partners, uh, which is the recruiting firm, and um, I'm like, look, <laughs> actually, it was, it was, it was funny because it was the thing that all managers hate, right? So you have an employee comes to you saying, hey, can we talk? You almost always know they're quitting. Um, so we have the conversation. He's like, give me a few hours and let's talk more. I'm like, that's fine. Comes back and, you know, basically says, I can't pay you what they're going to pay you, but you're one of the most technical guys I know. What if I took a chance on you and have you run technology for our company? Um, we want to grow. We want to expand. At that time, they had, I don't know, four or five different offices and stuff like that. So I'm like, yes, I want to do that. So I took that job um, and started changing telephone systems and infrastructure, all, I mean, all the stuff. The last thing was the software that we were using. It was terrible. I hated the software that we had at Kelly at the time, hated the software we had. Um, and after going through and looking at everything in market and also really analyzing the system that we were using, came up with an absolutely crazy idea that I could build a software. Um, went through, created a business case, created a business plan, all that, went back to Kent and said, I want to do this. And he's like, okay, this is pretty crazy. Um, talked to attorneys, talked to all the stuff, and decided, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do this. Um, so started building it, and then six months into it, I'm like, wait a second, we're nuts if we don't turn this into a commercialized product because we hate everything that's out there. We looked at everything that was there. Um, so I went back to Kent. I said, I got a crazier idea for you. Um, I want to I want to turn this into a business. So he's like, yes, that's a much much crazier idea. Um, went back to the attorney saying, what's, you know, what do we do? Um, but then ultimately we decided to do it. Um, and then, you know, that was in the 2009 timeframe when I started to build that 2011 after CB partners used the software for a short period of time, we, we went to market and that software is what talent Rover was. Um, and then I spent the next five and a half years scaling that company where ultimately we had nine offices in eight countries and folks literally literally around the world and customers in 40 countries and it was a it was a big success we landed the largest staffing company in the world as as one of our clients the adeco group and then landed a company called true blue and then i mean we're just off to the races with these big multi-billion dollar staffing firms um and then our biggest competitor started chasing us wanting to buy us. And at first it was no. And then finally it was like, okay, we can't turn that down. So let's accept it. And we accepted the deal in December of 2017 and then officially sold in, in March of 2018. I'm surprised, Brandon, there aren't more companies that are incubated within larger companies. Because it seems like in a, you do. I do. I just think, you know, where you go with it. And, you know, one of the challenges that I had to face with Talent Rover is the product couldn't just be what CV partners wanted. Um, and I think that's the challenge that you see. I think a lot of companies are incubated. But if you don't change the vision of where you're going to go, if you're still just the solution for your company, you're going to have a hard time succeeding. So I'll tell you, with Talent Rover, it was so many different lessons is learned. But one of them is the diversity, like staffing and recruiting is staffing and recruiting. From the outside, it looks like, okay, it's a fairly simple business to understand the concept of. You have companies that want to pay you to go find them employees to hire. It's not rocket science. But the way you do that, the way you differentiate yourself, the what makes you special, uh, the what makes your candidates like working with you, the what makes your client works likes working with you, what makes you successful in being able to place those people, that's your secret sauce. And recognizing that companies need diversity. And then it was really with the ADECO relationship that, you know, that got put on steroids where France does it different from the UK and the UK does it different from Hong Kong and Hong Kong does it differently from Japan. And there's all the cultural contexts and, and politics and, and, and labor laws. And it's just vast, but it goes back to really, who are you building the product for? If you're building it just for your company, you can build a phenomenal solution. But if you're building it as a commercialized product, you've got to expand your horizon and think about what does everyone else want this to do and listen to them um, in order for it to be successful. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people had to see your vision for this to happen. You had to nav I mean, it seems to me you had to navigate a lot of red tape. You had to get the leaders on board. You had to get lawyers and all this. 
how did you navigate all of this stuff? I mean, to you, maybe you look back, oh yeah, we did this. But to me, it looks pretty complicated to navigate this in that environment. You know, some of it was, I didn't know what I didn't know. So it's a little bit like, let's go do this. And coming from a guy who like the banking story is really relevant for how my brain works is, you know, I set a goal and I'm going to figure out a way to go make that happen. And I think that comes across when, when I'm in business relationships of, you know, I will, I will get things done. Um, there's also, um, I believe deeply in relationships and trust and loyalty. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that helped me with, with Kent, with Talent Rover, is the fact that I did turn Google down and the fact that I did invest. And like when, when I was building Talent Rover, I would work nonstop every single day and on the weekend. Like I was, I was constantly building that software. And I had just gotten into a relationship. Um, and, you know, it was like relationships number two. This is number one. Um, and I had to manage through that. And I think it was seeing that and seeing the work ethic and seeing, you know, I was giving my all that builds the trust in the relationship that, okay. And then also looking at, well, what's the vision and, and what does this thing do and um, where can it go? And really understanding the pain um, and painting the picture of how do you solve the pain in a way that people believe in confidence, you know, confidence is definitely a huge selling factor in anything you do, or if you believe it and you can exude that and back it up with why you believe it, people will take big risks on you. One of the things I love about that story, Brandon, in the, you know, your journey and trajectory from the banking is you went to the people who are doing it, who have done it. And you basically just said, like, how do I do what you do? Like they help lay out a path for you. And that applies to any industry really to go to the people who are doing it and have done it and figure out, you know, you kind of shortcut things by going to the people and they lay out the plan for you. Now, I mean, simple, not easy, right? Then you have to execute it, but, but still, um, you know, one thing that I observe Brandon from the outside is you seem to be really good at building teams. So I'd love to hear, um, you know, obviously you're running three companies, but you're not necessarily having to be in all three. Um, so I'd love to hear how your hiring process works and maybe what you learned, you mentioned with Google, they had 20 interviews. So if there's anything you learned from Google or along the way that you implement in your kind of hiring practices. Yeah, you don't need 20 interviews to hire someone. First <laughs> um, I think that's that's a bit extreme, but you do need to do your homework. And like, I've made plenty of mistakes with hiring people. Um, and in I've struggled with building teams at Talent Rover. I look back at that company and say, we we struggled with really building the right leadership team. And a lot of it, was I, I had too much control of the company. Um, every decision of that company had to basically go through me. Um, and it was a stranglehold for the company and I didn't know any better. Now, I, it's not how I run, run the businesses now, which is why I can do more of the things that I'm doing. Um, but, you know, I learned a long time ago from just my career and how it shaped to invest in the people that invest in you and that it goes both ways. Um, finding people, like, especially during the interview cycle, Asking them questions about the relationships they've built and why they've built them and how they've worked. And, you know, a question I love to ask is tell me about how you got to where you're at. Uh, and just seeing what they talk about. If it's all, I'm the best person, I did this, I did this, I did this, and you never mentioned another person in that story, that's a red flag for me because there's no way you got to where you're at just on your own. Um, and it, it's a red flag of like, do you value the relationships and do you respect the other people that have helped you get there? And, you know, realizing that if you do build solid relationships, you can get a lot further than if you try to tackle things on your own. Um, I'm a big fan of the culture index. I don't know if you've heard of that. I know we talk about a lot at EO. I think um, I think culture index is amazing. Um, really getting to understand how people are hardwired um, and how people um, perceive they need to work at a specific job and how qualified or, or what the, how they map to a job. I think that's all really helpful. I do genuinely value references. Um, like right now, for example, Blueprint, we're hiring a new either president or managing director to essentially run that business. Um, and I have a candidate I'm super excited about. We're in the final stages. 
and we met yesterday. I'm like, I need references. He's like, what references do you need? I'm like, I don't know. You tell me. Send me the people that are going to convince me that I need to hire you. Um, and all of a sudden, I got these amazing references that I'm going to call and I'm going to speak to every one of them to see you know, what the, uh, what the conversation is. But if you can't give me good references that can convince me to hire you, that's a red flag for me as well. Um, so it's, it's a lot of the people, um, you've got to hire people that can do the job, obviously, so they have the skill sets. But I learned in recruiting, this is hopefully helpful for this. When I was actually on the desk recruiting people, I love to find candidates that had terrible resumes. Uh, because the terrible resume is doing such an awful job of painting why they're the perfect candidate for a position that I would interview them and dig in and figure out where where they're actually good at or good for and get them in front of those hiring managers. And then I would convince the hiring manager, you need to talk to them. Yes, the resume is awful. Don't look at the resumes. Here's what you're going to, when you meet this person, this is what you're going to get. And I made more placements on candidates from doing that because none of my competitors would ever look at that person because on paper, it's like, yeah, I don't get it. But there's more to a person than the resume, obviously. Love it. Talk about Assemble. Then, what did you learn from Talent Rover that now you bring into Assemble? And I was saying before we hit record, you know, you're kind of a glutton for punishment. You're starting this. You're starting another company in this space. Yeah, I mean, things just kind of fall into place. Um, I, uh, I when I sold Talent Rover, I thought I was I was done with staffing and recruiting. Not in a bad way. It's just like build a great product, deliver it on what I said, and. You know, of course, then you have non-competes and stuff like that, where I'm like, okay, I need to go figure out what I want to do next and start a place and blueprint. Um, Assemble just just sort of came because of, of need. Um, we were being asked to advise um, uh, staffing firms on how to use Salesforce, how to think about Salesforce. We were also deeply collaborating with Salesforce about how Salesforce should think about staffing and recruiting and just building relationships, just genuinely trying to help people. And that was about a year and a half all that started to go, uh, which was also ironic because our non-competes had just ended when all of this stuff starts coming in. So it's just like timing in, in life is, is always very interesting to me. But um, so we start doing all this advisory stuff and then it just it's just starts to paint the picture that in staffing and recruiting, not a lot has changed in the five or six years since I've I've been out of the space. Like a lot has, but a lot hasn't. Like you still have the same technology platforms. You still have the same challenges. I was at a big conference um, a few weeks back, the, the big staffing industry analyst conference in Miami, and everyone's talking about digital transformation. I'm like, well, shit, everyone's talking about digital transformation 10 years ago. Um, and Brad Owens from Salesforce was on a panel and he he's like, yeah, everyone keeps talking about digital transformation because digital itself has changed. So like he brought up the fax machine in recruiting. And when I first started in recruiting, I wanted to sit next to the fax machine. I wanted to sit next to the fax machine because that's where candidates sent their resumes. And I wanted the resume before someone else so I could see if I could go place the candidate. So obviously now we don't, I don't know of anyone that has a fax machine. Um, it's all electronic um, PDF stuff. Um, so the world's changed. So digital's changed. But the technology that I saw in the space and the way to go about technology I think didn't evolve. Then, you know, me being a Salesforce guy and Talent Rover being built on Salesforce, just started to looking at like a lot of staffing and recruiting firms want to use Salesforce because of the way you engage and collaborate and visualize and analyze all of your people interactions, which is how I really think about Salesforce. Um, and there's really two ways that staffing firms have always engaged with Salesforce because Salesforce isn't just built for staffing, right? So you can either build your own solution, which, you know, there's companies spending tens of millions of dollars every year, these big billion dollar staffing firms to do that. Um, or you buy a solution like a talent rover was, which was a full platform. Well, there's limitations with that as well as you buy from talent rover, you have a contract with talent rover, not Salesforce and just pricing and, and limitations. And we came up with the different ideas like, what if there's a way to assemble your tech stack on Salesforce? So like the analogy my business partner, Greg, comes up with, he's like, think about cable. We used to buy Comcast or whatever cable provider, right? And you get all of these channels. And there's usually one channel you really want, but to get that one channel, you have to pay the extra package 
to get all the other stuff that you don't even care about, but you're just trying to get that one channel. And now all of a sudden you're spending a couple hundred bucks a month on cable. Well, streaming Netflix completely changed that where instead of having to buy one big package for one provider, now I can go to the individual streaming services and buy for however long I want to use it, the individual like shows essentially that I want. So if I want to watch something on HBO Max, I can buy that. If I want to watch Netflix, whatever. But they've done it in a way where it's economical, where I can actually have all of these different streaming services to get the content I want. But I'm still spending less than I would have if I would have bought the whole cable package. That's our same philosophy, which is why we call the company Assemble. Of Let's assemble business process specific uh, apps for staffing and recruiting that are on Salesforce. That you pick which ones you need and you simply just turn them on, but you only pay for the licenses for the people that need those specific things. And um, it's been really exciting and the reception has been crazy phenomenal. At that staffing conference, one uh, one executive was like, Salesforce and Assemble combined are, are like a freight train rolling into staffing and recruiting are just going to completely disrupt it. And so far, it seems to be true with just the, the amount of business that uh, is flowing our way. So we're excited to see where it'll go. You know, Brandon, when you were thinking, oh, okay, we're going to move forward with Assemble, and um, how did you, it sounds like you have a partner as well. How did you decide to start this with a partner and how'd you beat the partner? Yeah. So, you know, in, in late 2018, beginning of 2019, I decided to start Place and I wanted to, to build Place to solve the problems that I had when I was scaling Talent Rover from an operation standpoint. Um, at the same time, I was getting hit up by just a lot of people that knew I was available for wanting consulting, um, business consulting, Salesforce consulting, software consulting, et cetera. That turned into like a healthy little business and that that started Blueprint. I'm like, well, I'm not going to walk away from all of this. Like, this is great. This is great business. Let's do both at once. And then, you know, as Place and Blueprint continued, Place definitely became the primary focus. Um, Blueprint, I needed someone to run it. And, you know, uh, Greg Simmons, who worked with me at Talent Rover, um, he was basically my my right hand for all enterprise sales. Um, and we we were in the trenches together. He came on to to be the president of Blueprint and to run that on a daily basis. Um, you know, I have another co-founder on the play side, Cabe, who's also with us at Talent Rover. Um, and he's focused 99% of his time just on, on uh, operational stuff at place. So Cabe's helping me on the play side. Greg's really running Blueprint on a day-to-day basis, and Blueprint is doing Consulting work, but also being the distrib- distribution delivery arm for Place, because I also learned at Talent Rover, I did not want to be a services company and a product company all in the same company. I wanted to separate the two, and there's a lot of reasons why. Um, so then, a uh, year and a half or so ago, when we started having all these conversations about staffing again, originally we were doing all of that work under Blueprint. Um, and Probably we're going to continue on a blueprint until all of a sudden we started thinking, wait, there's a software company here that we need to create. Um, And then there was a conversation about, do we just keep it all under blueprint? Well, there's this thing called QSBS, um, Qualified Small Business Stock, which if you're in software, it's something for you to be really aware of. Whereas if you qualify for QSBS, you can actually save a lot on taxes, on federal taxes, if you exit the business. Um, so we started to analyze that. We also started to analyze what's the potential of the business. And we decided we really do need to separate the staffing software, recruiting software away from Blueprint. Um, and then the beginning of, of this year, we actually formally formalized a C Corp for, for Assemble. Um, and Greg is going to be moving or has moved from running Blueprint to now running Assemble, which is why we're, we're finding the new managing director for, for Blueprint to backfill him. Um, but it's very much a relationship play. So like talking about culture index, I'm an enterpriser, like tried and true, super, super high A, let's just go. Um, Greg, I forget what he is, but he, his A is as extreme on the low side as mine is on the, on the high side. And our facilitator at culture index was like, how in the world do you two get along? And it's like, we have the most symbiotic relationship. We just completely know how to work with each other. Um, and it was through the years of all the work that we did and the trust that we built from from Talent Rover that 
we're true business partners and I don't need to worry about what he's doing. And I'm there to help and guide and motivate and all of that stuff. But uh, he runs the day to day. Amazing. I want to shift gears to place. Um, can you talk a little bit about place technology? Yeah. So place has been a, a, a fun challenge to, to live. Um, so originally starting up place, I wanted to solve financial forecasting for early stage SaaS companies because we, we got really good at it, um, at, at talent river, but it was all manual. Um, all these spreadsheets that I was spending, you know, my accounting team was probably spending well over a hundred hours a month on, I was probably spending in my personal time, 20 to 30 hours a month while also flying around the world, doing all the madness I was doing, um, because we needed to have accurate numbers. And really for us, um, we were, we never raised institutional money for talent rover, but we raised $28 million. Um, from angels um, and for place, one of the things, yeah, uh, at Talent Rover before place. Oh, got and it. We were doing it all manually, um, so we were doing manual direct cash flow forecasts, all that. So I wanted to solve that problem that I know other founders had. And when we started place, we were financial forecasting um, only, and through the first few years, really started to figure out our customers wanted something different from that. Finance is important. But there's more of an operational running the business element here. And what we've evolved to is we essentially do three different things. We do customer subscription management. So managing, you know, your first sell with the customer, add-on licenses, reduction licenses, renewals, all of reporting around that. We do all the revenue recognition. So the ASC 606, daily rev rec, all that fun stuff. Um, we then do billing. Um, so getting your invoices out, getting your invoices out on time, which in a high volume B2B SaaS company can be hard because you can be adding and removing licenses a lot. So what are you actually invoicing your customer managing that? Um, and then we send that into the finance element of the business. So doing your financial forecast, your cash plan, and then getting all the analytics. So what are all your metrics? You know, how are you performing? Um, in real time, so you can produce your board reports and and just understand how the business is going. And we do all that inside of Salesforce, which makes us really different. But one of the reasons why we wanted to do it in Salesforce is it's really the operating system for most of these SaaS companies. So we wanted to connect the full flow of data. We want to go from sales to cash and give everyone the full visibility of what's happening in the business. So it's transparent. You can collaborate on it. It's real time, and you can just run a more effective business. And you know automate what can be automated so that you can simplify what you're focusing on. So you can focusing on your customers instead of focusing on, you know, all these disparate systems that you're constantly having to move data and audit data um, and just waste a bunch of time on. And, and that's what we've, what we've set up to do. Love it. Yeah. If, if you're just listening to the audio, if you are watching the video as well, I'm actually, we're on the place technology.com uh, website and um you know, Brandon, so what are we looking at here? So when I say here, there's a dashboard here and you can see a bunch of things. It says pipeline creation, um, sales cycle, win ratio, bookings, ARR. What are we looking at? Yeah, I mean, this particular example is just an example of one of our board reports is board sales performance. So how are we doing from a sales standpoint? We probably have at this point close to 200 different dashboards, reports and components um, that cover the full lay of the land for running a SaaS business. So everything from leads to bookings to actual revenue to expenses to employees to hiring plans to cash flow, all of that's grouped together. So, you know, with Place, we do a lot of this in Salesforce just from operations where your sales team's managing opportunities and winning deals and, and all of that. But then we also have these bi-directional integrations with the accounting system. So we are actually pulling in all of your accounting data into Salesforce at a transaction level. So we can do variance analysis from what you thought you were going to do to what you actually did. But we can also then give think, your sales team, your customer support team full visibility. So imagine like you're a salesperson trying to target an account. Well, it'd be really helpful when I go and look at that account in Salesforce to know what's our financial relationship with, with that company. Have they ever bought from us? Or have we ever bought from them? Are they a vendor? If they're a vendor, that's a lot... Of a, that's a very much different conversation when I'm approaching them about trying to sell to them than if we have no relationship at all. So it's just that level of visibility and transparency to try to give people 
the information that they need to do their job as effectively as possible. Yeah. I want to talk about a use case, but um, first I just want to talk about, you know, for this company, for Place, um, you raise funding for Place too, right? Yeah, we're about, so, so we're finishing a, a small funding round now. So we're, we've raised, I don't know, close to about $12 million for Place. So when you made that decision, what were in your mind some of the advantages and disadvantages? I mean, building a software company is expensive, um, especially if you want to grow fast, right? Um, so there's there's a lot of conversation with the economic climate right now about you know this mind shift of switching from growth at all costs to running capital efficient businesses. I've actually always tried to run capital efficient businesses, but in software and technology in general, like you have to be innovating, you have to be growing, or else someone's going to come and eat your lunch. Um, so you do have to push, and you know that push requires capital to get there. Um, so I, I learned a lot from my my time at Talent Rover and how we raised money there, and it influenced how we raised money at Place. Like Talent Rover was all angel investors, except at the end, you know, our largest customer invested uh, quite a bit with us right before we got acquired. But other than other than that, there was no institutional ever there. Which was a blessing and a curse, right? Like we never had a VC to answer to or private equity to answer to, but we always had angels and there was always the risk of, are you going to run out of cash or not? Luckily, we had super angels that had the ability to write, you know, several million dollars each uh, to fund it. So when I launched Place, I wanted to, one, welcome all those investors from Talent Rover into Place um, because we did have a a very nice exit Um, and and a lot of them came over. But I really wanted to bring on a venture capital firm. Um, and I wanted it because I wanted their experience. Um, and I luckily got multiple term sheets from, from various different VCs. I ultimately chose Geekdom Fund down in San Antonio, um, primarily because I'm angel, I was angel invested in a deal that they were invested in. So I got to see how the managing partner, Mike, interacted with Geekdom. And I really liked his style and approach. Um, so Geekdom invested. Geekdom's invested in every single round with us since. Mike and I have a deep relationship. He's a great guy. I really respect him. But the value I get from him is just different perspective, different introductions. Um, it's a healthy, healthy relationship where, you know, they're not trying to micromanage us. Um, they're trying to help us. They're really trying to support us. And whenever you're looking at raising money from someone, you've got to look beyond just the check. The check is the check. It's the rest of the relationship. It's, are they going to help you? Are they going to support you? Are they going to be in your corner? Stuff is ultimately going to go wrong. You know, I look at place. We've done pivots ever since we started. Like we started off pure financial forecasting. And then we added revenue recognition and billing. Now we added customer subscription. And now I think we've really have figured out product market fit, which we figured out last year. Um, but if I didn't have the right investors supporting us as we're trying to navigate this, it would have been very, very difficult, not only with trying to figure it out, then having people that didn't have your back and who have a vested interest in the company. So just like you were talking about recruiting and how do you select who you hire, you got to do the exact same thing with who your investors are. And sometimes you need to turn checks down um, where it's just not going to help you or the business be successful. Yeah, and Brandon, I think there is, I don't know if it was Mike, but there is definitely um, one of the VCs interviewing you on a show, which was which was really good. Oh, they Andrew. were they were yeah. it was Andrew. Okay. Yeah. And so they were walking through some questions. So it was it was a fascinating conversation. So I encourage people to check that out as well. His podcast, Andrew is a really dynamic guy. They came in the last round um for for a small amount. Um, but he's a he's got books written. I have couple of his books behind me somewhere. Um, but his podcast is legit. And if you want to learn about the world about VC, um, Andrew Romans is his name. Um, he's definitely a guy to follow. He teaches a course at, I forget what university, about venture as well. Yeah. I'm trying, I'm blanking on the, do you remember the name of the show? Of their podcast? Uh, or should... He's going to kill me, but I don't. Hold on, let me see if I I'll have to look it up. Um, and then the name of their company, what's the name of their VC firm? Uh, seven BC. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, because I do remember. Um, maybe that is the name of the podcast. Uh, possibly. No, it's Fireside with the VC. 
Fireside with the VC. Okay, cool. Yeah, his name Check is Andrew out. Romans. So if you look for Andrew Romans, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Great. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, with place technology, you know, you is if you're looking at the page here, you can say trusted by, you know, B2B SaaS companies, and we have a bunch here. So I'd love to walk through um there's conveyor, there's Portnox, Elise AI. What what did you do for with Elise AI? Yeah, I mean, they're they're a good example of why we're inside of Salesforce. Um, so Elise is a phenomenal company. Um, they're in the um, real estate space. Um, and essentially what they approached us for, or maybe we approached them, I forget how we got connected, but um, you know, they had been trying to customize Salesforce to truly support running a software, a SaaS software business, like so many companies we see. And trying to really get the full flow from A to Z to work for their, their their business. And, you know, what we've seen across the board, not just with the lease, but generalized, is companies spend a lot of money trying to customize Salesforce to get it to do specific things for B2B SaaS. Like, how do you manage subscriptions? How do you flow that into billing? How do you get that into your financial systems? How do you understand how you're performing? Um, and ultimately it's a blessing and a curse. It, it's funny because it's going back to what I was saying with the symbol, right? Where you could build or buy same thing with this. Like most SaaS companies are trying to build a solution in Salesforce to help them run their business. What we do is we come in and say, look, what you're trying to do is exactly what we built our product to do. Um, so instead of you trying to reinvent it, here's a component that does exactly that. But because the component is inside of Salesforce, you can still modify it to, to contain your secret sauce. So like your custom field, your workflows, your valid, all that stuff will still flow. But the nuts and the bolts about how the, how's the data move, how's the data process, how's the data reported off of, we do that very, very well. So that's what we're doing with Elise is solving their subs customer subscription management challenges, solving their rubric challenges, solving their billing challenges, and then connecting that all to their financial systems. Um, and it's what we've, we've done for so many different companies. We just brought on a new company um, a couple of weeks ago that we're super excited about because they were they were at our biggest competitor. And it's fun because now when we go against our biggest competitor, I think it's about 60% of the time now we win, which is a great place to be in. Um, but we win because it's not just we're not just a point solution of solving like one specific thing. Um, we're a business workflow solution. Like, how do we help your team really do their job? And how do we connect all the dots for you? So you can automate what needs to be automated. It's all accurate and correct. But you can focus on doing what you would probably want to focus on, which is engaging with prospects and customers. So I do want to talk about running continue. It reminds me one of the one of the episodes I did. Um, it was with Moise Navone, who is the founding engineer at Mobileye, which is like an autonomous vehicle chip company. And they were approached by Intel and and they had that build versus buy conversation. And um Intel ended up purchasing them for over $15 billion. Um, so apparently <laughs> building it would be a lot harder, but it was he walked through kind of the conversations of that they had with Intel because obviously they're gonna go back and go, can we just go build this and not buy this company? But it was would be more expensive. And a lot of times, like you're saying, these companies who try and build what you've invested so many hours and money, it's just, it's hard to, it looks maybe on the surface, oh, we could build this, but you have yeah. a huge head start and it took a lot of time and energy to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's the symbol theme even at place is companies still need to be able to create workflows and processes that are unique to their business. And that's one of the biggest reasons why companies ultimately go to Salesforce. Like I hear all the time um, for a place that are like, are you ever going to have a HubSpot product? I'm like, no, I'm not. Like the Salesforce ecosystem is plenty big enough for us to play in. And honestly, I think just about every company eventually from a CRM standpoint goes to Salesforce. I think HubSpot's a great product. We actually use HubSpot for marketing. And I think it's phenomenal for for what it for for that. But I think most companies eventually go to Salesforce. And why do they go to Salesforce? Because of the flexibility of what you can do with the platform. So we have this mindset of, well, can we create, we we think of them kind of as commodities at this point. Can we create the commodity, the tool 
that you need to, to fill in the gaps for your process. The tool that's super complex to build that you know you can try to get right and you can spend a fortune trying to do it, but generally that tool is usually the same for every other type of company. So for every other SaaS company, how you manage subscriptions, initial add-on reductions, churn renewals, the nuts and the bolts of that is pretty much the same. Everything else around it can be unique and specialized to your business. And that's essentially what we do is drop that in, connect it to accounting and finance, get the whole flow of data, making sure that the system's architected in a way where you can visualize and report off of the data in a way that it makes sense. So, you know, it's it's fun for me because everyone's like, you run three different businesses. It's like, no, I actually have two people that run two of the businesses. I run one. But they're all so interconnected, like place and assemble as much as they're very, very different products. Philosophically, they're very similar as to what we're doing. Yeah. Brandon, first of all, thank you. I have one last question. Before I ask it, I want to point people to your websites. People can check out placetechnology.com and um, their, their podcast link is also on there as well. Um, and then blueprintadvisory.com. Um, where can people find Assemble? So Assemble is just spelled a little funky. Um, so it's A-S-Y-M-B-L dot com. So Assemble. All right. Go and check out Assemble. I think you could find Assemble under blueprintadvisory.com as well. There. Easiest way is just to go to my LinkedIn. <laughs> if you want to know anything about me, just go to my LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so Brandon, last question um, is, I'm always fascinated um, by tattoos. And so um, talk, <laughs> I've got a few about, yeah, talk about your your tattoos for a second. You know, I have a sleeve that it took me 20 years to get built out. Um, I just have always liked tattoos. It's funny because I usually forget I have it. Um, when I met, so when I got interviewed for my EO forum the group, I was wearing a long sleeve shirt that day. And like, we're in the middle of the interview and they're just asking me questions. And I just roll up my sleeves casually just because I got a little warm. And you just saw all of them go, what the? And because my personality in a business meeting, you would not think I'm going to be a guy that has a sleeve tattoo, but I do. So they're like, wait, that just changed our entire perception. <laughs> um, How did it change it? Uh, they, they, I, I can come across very um, stoic, very completely business focused. And then I was like, okay, well, maybe there's a different side of you. We don't know. And it's all this still like, I'm still the same guy, like for me, which is why I always forget I have the tattoo. I just have always liked the way they looked and decided to to get one built out. Yeah. I was asking, cause like it, the same thing happened. It was in the middle of, I was watching an interview with you and all of a sudden I think you raised your arm a little bit. I'm like, Oh, I did not <laughs> see that coming. <laughs> So I didn't know I if there was that. anything significant, you know, significant that you have on there. I imagine, you know, you're inking something permanently on you. There must be something significant. I don't know. It's more dear, the art, dear to your right? heart on your. On yeah, your... no, there's not any deep meaning to any of my tattoos. Um, it's just the art. So I'm a big art guy too. Like you were on my house, we have a lot of different art because I just appreciate art. Um, and this is kind of how I look at the tattoo. Mm. I just think they, if they're well executed, they can be beautifully designed. Yeah. We'll hold that up for a second. Let's let's uh take a look. No, okay. Yeah. It's all over the place. It's mostly Love Japanese it. inspired. Like I've got a huge Buddha here, which is my favorite. Um, but I have no direct tie to any other Japanese piece. I just thought it was really, really pretty. Love it. Brandon, thank you. Everyone check out Assemble, Place Technology, uh, blueprintadvisory.com, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, right, Brandon. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand